Everybody enjoying their breakfast? <laughs> Good. It truly is nice to come to a conference if you have celiac disease and you don't have to worry about what you're eating. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for being here today. So we're going to, I guess when I get the signal, we'll go live. So. We're good? Good morning, I'm Alice Bast, CEO of Beyond Celiac. Welcome to our 2019 Beyond Celiac Research Summit, both to our local attendees that are here in this room and everybody globally who is being webcasted. We're so, so excited that you can join us. Beyond Celiac serves a unique role of convening this multidisciplinary group of stakeholders all working for a better future for all of us so that we can live life to the fullest and eat without fear. We now firmly believe with a strategic approach to funding highly targeted practical research and effective treatment or cure will be a possibility in the next 15 years. Do I hear a big hurrah for that? To accomplish this goal, we need to be very laser focused and address the many barriers currently standing between us and success. Beyond Celiac is all about coming together for a cure. This summit is a big step toward making that dream a reality. Our community is hungry, and not just for gluten-free food, we actually want an opportunity to participate in research. And to be heard, we need our voices heard. In fact, more than 5,000 survey responses from people with celiac disease and parents of children with celiac disease will help drive this morning's agenda and to the topics that we're going to be discussing here today. Celiac disease is a serious genetic autoimmune disease and needs to re receive the attention and the funding that any important public health issue deserves. We need to be able, again, to eat without fear. That's my, that's my saying, and live life to the fullest. Thank you one and all for your participation and for, for working with us to be the catalyst and the next wave of research and discovery. I want to thank our, very, our many sponsors and our donors to, for making this gathering possible. Decatur Pharmaceuticals, Prevention Bio, Janssen, the Bausch Foundation, SQ, Enochion, Dr. Shar, USA. And I also want to recognize the staff, the Scientific Advisory Council, the board from Beyond Celiac for working to make today's event and all of our work possible. Now, I'd like to introduce our Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Marie Robert. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good morning. Well, I will add my welcome to all of you uh, to the summit. Each of you has been invited to join in this working retreat because you are crucial to achieving the final goal of, de of developing real treatments for celiac disease. Who are we? We represent every stakeholder group that cares passionately about improving the lives of people with celiac disease. Patients, caregivers, pediatric and adult clinician scientists, basic scientists, drug developers, the FDA, insurance industry, and patient advocacy groups. Why are we here? We are here to plan our path to the top of the mountain. Today, we have a unique opportunity to be the advanced team, placing the handholds that will allow us and those who follow us to reach the summit. The fact that you are here is a testament to your commitment to hearing different perspectives, wanting to understand and collaborate for a good outcome for all parties involved. And I want to make it very clear we are not here only to talk today. The day will culminate in our closing session when together 
we will identify immediate, mid, and long-term action items and strategies, both for individual stakeholder groups and for the community as a whole to realize. A few logistics. The flow. This day consists of eight unique stakeholder discussions, two summary sessions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and a strategic planning finale where we will develop action items. Moderators will introduce topics, introduce their panels, engage their panels, and then the general audience for questions and commentary. It will be my role to keep us on time. This day is going to fly by. Uh, and please don't be um, disturbed in any way if I interrupt or interject um, to keep us going. We will also want to stay on topic. So important topics that arise that may be slightly off of the main focus, we will put in the parking lot on the flip chart, chart over here for discussion at a later time. I would like to also announce Joe Azar, Azar, our graphic designer, who will catalog the day uh, and what happens. Thank you. Capturing key points of today's discussion. A couple of ground rules. Uh, this entire event is being recorded, audio recorded, solely for the purposes of Beyond Celiac staff who will be writing up the notes and creating the white paper from the notes uh, today. This recording will not be heard by anyone outside of a couple people at Beyond Celiac. But therefore, speak into the microphone. Every table has a microphone uh, and it is muted. When you, when you pick it up, preferably stand, say your name, and your comment or question, and don't be shy. This is an interactive day. Uh, and the microphones will be turned on and off by the controllers at the back of the room. Please build on the prior discussions. We're not going to start back at the beginning uh, with each session. And I would ask, because of timing, for smooth transition. So panelists, as you see, it's about to be your session. Uh, please note the stairs are on this side of the uh, stage and um, um, come to the stage in a timely fashion. Before we begin, I just want to say a couple more things. I'd like to acknowledge our, our amazing staff. Kate Avery and Claire Baker uh, have been in charge of all the logistics from soup to nuts for this shindig. Uh, uh, Amy Ratner will be working with Kate to write the white paper, the first draft, and has also been helping throughout. And Maria and Jackson have been helping uh, in uh, numerous ways, also in the background. My last couple of slides is to acknowledge that we did a lot of pre-work for this session. You all, or many of you, sent to me what you already feel are the barriers to establishing therapies in celiac disease. Uh, what I will only note from this slide, you have copies of this, you've received them already, and they're on your tables. There are a lot of barriers, and this is what we're going to be about changing today. As Alice mentioned, Beyond Celiac sent out a survey. If you have any doubt about the interest of people with celiac disease in our topic, uh, you can rest assured they are interested. In a scant two-week period, we got um, about 6,000 responses. 4,500 adults and 487 parent caregivers. Just the last two points before we launch into our patient panels. Uh, more than half of folks, or about half, have said in the past month they or their child had to skip an activity because of celiac disease, or more than half said that they, they or their family decided not to pursue a major life event because of celiac disease. Then I would also like to point out that in terms of participating in clinical trials, our second patient panel, 26% uh, or less are willing to take short and long-term gluten challenges as of this moment in time. So these will form uh, some of the um, discussion points today. Uh, without further ado, may I please invite um, our first um, moderator, Ann Lee, an assistant professor of nutrition at Columbia and her panel. Would they all please come to the stage? And welcome to the summit. The day is off.
to stand here just to introduce my panel and to introduce our topic. Our topic is the burden of disease. And what I want to just frame our discussion in just a brief introduction. While celiac disease is still underdiagnosed and research is underfunded, there is still a wealth of clinical research that details the burden of the disease for our patients. Studies by many of the clinicians here in this room today describe the diminished quality of life, the impact of the diet on social life, the cost and nutritional concerns of the diet, but this only describes the top of the iceberg, if we will, that this does not describe the day-to-day -day life of those living with celiac disease. Today, our panel, my wonderful panel, will describe what it is to walk in the shoes of those with celiac disease. As we heard last night from our um, Dr. Beal, one of the major stumbling blocks, it seems to be for really accelerating development and research is that celiac disease is not thought to be a deadly disease like cystic fibrosis. And I challenge that thought. Celiac disease may not be deadly physically as is cystic fibrosis, but I want to have you open your mind to these discussions because I think on a day-to-day -day basis, living with celiac disease, living with the gluten-free diet, there are emotional and social little nicks that will, over time, diminish one's life expectancy. And with further ado, I welcome my panel, and I will have them each um, describe their story and their journey, and then we'll proceed into some questions which I hope you will join us with. My panel today. is Julie Kennedy, uh, Kate Kenyon, Priyanka Chug, and Natalie Dabrowski. Julie, I'm gonna have you start. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Julie Kennedy. I have three kids. They're 13, 11, and seven. And I have celiac disease along with my 13-year-old daughter. And when I was, starting when I was young, I did not like bread, pizza, pasta, and I never understood why. I wasn't sick, I just didn't like it. And I had people all the time ask me, how can you not like pizza? And I was like, I don't know, I just don't like it. it. I had one piece and it felt like I had the whole pizza, but I never really felt sick, it just, I just didn't like it. Um, and when I was pregnant with my third child, I got food poisoning. And it felt like ever since after that, I never felt right. I only gained 13 pounds with that pregnancy. He luckily was born a healthy, beautiful baby. Um, but I, every morning after he was born, I would be in the bathroom for a while. <clears throat> and I would start, I was losing weight. I was also anemic. And I, and I would go to the doctor and they would say, well, are you tired? And I would say, I have three children. I am a middle school math teacher. Yes, I'm tired. Um, so I just thought that it was just part of what, my normal life. Um, and then I met someone who told me she was avoiding gluten. And I said, I, what do you mean? What, do, what are the foods you don't eat? And so she went through the whole list. And I was like, those are all the foods I don't like. So I went to the doctor. And uh, the PA that I saw has had celiac disease. And she said, I should test you for celiac disease. And I was like, well, okay, I, I, don't you think I would know if I had that? This seemed, I mean, you can go ahead. But So she called me t a week later and said that uh, my numbers uh, were higher than she's seen, and she wants me to have an endoscopy. So I said, I don't even know what this is. I literally Googled celiac disease to find out what it was and what it meant. Um, and then I also, through my research, found out that it was genetic. My oldest daughter, around two years old, started falling off the growth charts. Um, she wore 2T clothes for like three, four years. We would go to the doctor. They would say, come back in six months. We'll check it again. So we would go back in six months, and it would still be the same. She would start to just slowly fall off the growth chart. It was finally, we did the bone scan. We did all kinds of tests and no one seemed to have an idea of what it was. Well, when I got diagnosed, I did tons of research. I used 
NFCA's website like crazy and figured out that it was genetic. And no one told me that. I figured all that out on my own. Took them in and my oldest daughter's numbers were higher than mine. Um, she had an endoscopy as well and her MARSH score was a 3A. Um, so she, and she was eight at the time and she was the size of a five-year-old. Her, her sister, who was two years younger, was about the same size as her. Um, so when I first got diagnosed, I was like, I can handle this. This is fine. I don't really like gluten anyway. But then when it turned into my child, it totally changed everything. And um, our house is gluten-free. Um, we, when we go out to eat, we have to find the gluten-free restaurants. Um, there are like two. I'm in Raleigh and uh, North Carolina, and there's not a, not a lot to choose from. When we travel, uh, where we go depends on whether my daughter and I will have safe food. So what I'd like to speak to today, most the biggest impact on our family and the people that I know with celiac disease is the psychosocial impact. Every time we go out to eat, every time, without fail, like unless we're here at this conference, um, we worry. I worry for myself. What if I get sick? What if I, you know, while we're here, who did we ride with? Will I have a ride home in case I get sick? I don't have time to get sick. Tomorrow I've got to be at this, that, and the other. I'm just not going to eat it. What about my daughter? Is she growing? Is she able to think clearly at school because of the things that she has to worry about? So all of these things, along with <clears throat> the projection of where we're going, uh, when she goes to college, when she goes to summer camp, all of these things put together create a great amount of stress, um, guilt as a mother. When she went those six years without knowing what was happening, every time we fed her bread, I tell this to people and it may be an exaggeration, we might as well have given her a cigarette because of the damage that it was doing to her body. And so I, as a mother, I felt like I had two jobs, to keep my daughter safe and to feed her. And in through that, I, f I failed. Now, I didn't know that, but that's how I felt. So I do want to say thank you to everybody that is here. You are helping my daughter. You're helping me. And we really, really, from the bottom of our hearts, appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. I would like next to introduce Natalie Dabrowski who also has a child with celiac disease. I want you to hear from her side, too. Good morning. Um, my name is Natalie. My daughter, Gracie, is nine years old. Um, she's the oldest of my four children, um, nine, um, seven, five, and three. So they're all very close together. She's the only one that's diagnosed with celiac. My husband and I do not, um, or at least um, we've had testing and, and are not diagnosed and the same my other children have been screened um, and they have not been diagnosed as well um, she prior to her being diagnosed I want to say maybe four or five months she lost her hair in about eight weeks um, it came out very rapidly um, and at that time you know I'd been between pediatrician and the dermatologist and was told it was just, um, you know, it was autoimmune hair loss. Hers was more severe than most um, children that go through it, but, you know, she had alopecia and that was sort of all that it was. Um, but of course, that's, you know, there's a lot of social impact, for, you know, with hair loss. And I wanted to be able to tell her, you know, I tried everything to see what was going on. Um, so I really pushed for getting testing. I wasn't sure what I was looking for. I just, wanted some type of explanation other than, you know, her hair just fell out. Um, so we proceeded to get, um, you know, her lab work done. Um, they put vitamin panels in and then I guess an array of autoimmune um, testing and her celiac panels, which I didn't even know what celiac disease was at the time. Um, her, you know, serology came back and um, it was, you know, off the charts. Um, so, of course, I researched it, you know, and tried to figure out what it was, what, what exactly we had to do. We hadn't gotten the endoscopy yet. 
Um, but that shortly came after, and then it confirmed her diagnosis. Um, and retrospectively, when I look back, because at the time I was really just concerned about this hair loss, um, you know, there were other signs, and there were signs that had gone back. You know, she had severe um, constipation, um, irrational anger. She would be angry for like a couple hours and for no good reason, maybe from a timeout. But I, you know, she's my oldest, so I thought, well, maybe they just act this. She's a girl. Maybe she's being dramatic. Um, so I, I wasn't, you know, at the time it was just chalked up to normal childhood things. Um, she had severe constipation. I can remember when she was younger, maybe around four, you know, having to give her like an enema, you know, to get things moving and even visiting a GI um, and was told, you know, let's put her on like a diet high in fiber, make sure she's getting water intake. Um, and so I think what's hard is I, I think like if she had been diagnosed maybe three years prior or when she was younger, you know, would that have resulted in a total hair loss? Um, so that's something that I always think about and wonder. And of course, when you have multiple children, you know, you wonder if maybe they too might have um, celiac as well. Uh, but we have a gluten-free household. And so, you know, when they're eating primarily gluten-free, it's really hard to get them tested. Um, so that's something that weighs heavy on me because if I have to go down the road of getting them screened, they've all been screened once initially, I have to, you know, build it back in. It causes a lot of anxiety. I hide rolls in the house and try to, you know, put it in their lunch. And it's, it's very stressful because you almost feel like it's poison, even though it may not be um, for your other children. So, um, yeah, I thank you for letting me share my story. Um, yeah, and thank you for letting me be here today. Thank you very much. I'd like to now go to Katie um, and, and for her to describe her story and journey. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Katie Kenyon. Um, I live outside of Philadelphia. Um, I first was sick with uh, uh, undiagnosed uh, celiac around the age of 21. Um, I saw doctors for 11 years in the Midwest. Um, I was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, depression, anxiety, um, and my symptoms persisted. I had very classic celiac symptoms. Um, I got married when I was 32, I moved to Pennsylvania, um, and within three months of arriving in Pennsylvania, I was really, really sick, um, and my husband decided to take me to the emergency department. So I got to the emergency department, the emergency room doctor said, it's probably stress. I worked in domestic violence, so I worked in a in social service field. The number of times I was told it was stress-related <coughs> and that these, this kind of job is very stressful, um, so I was told this in the emergency room, um, but they ran some tests and um, the physician came back, the emergency room doctor came back and said, you know, we're gonna do a blood transfusion. Your iron levels are really, really low. They shouldn't be this low. We're gonna prep you for a blood transfusion. Came back a few minutes late. They did a CT scan, came back a few minutes later, a few hours later, um, and said that I had clotting disorders and so that they weren't gonna do the blood transfusion. They were gonna release me. Um, so I saw a hematologist, I saw two different gastroenterologists, and finally I set foot in my uh, brand new primary care doctor's office, and within the first couple of minutes of having me in his office, he said, I think you probably have celiac disease, let's run the test. So the first time in 11, 12 years, someone ran a celiac test, um, my, the panel came back positive, I had the endoscopy, and um, it was verified. Um, I, so I, it's been 12 years, I've been on a gluten-free diet for 12 years. Um, I feel like I'm in a good part of the country in terms of getting gluten-free food. I'm not far <coughs> from um, beyond celiac, so there's a fairly high level of knowledge about celiac disease in the Philadelphia region, as well as teaching hospitals. So there's a fair, you know, the, the, there's uh, celiac research happening um, in Philadelphia. Um, my Difficulties didn't end with a gluten-free diet. So um, in the four years after I was diagnosed with celiac, I had three miscarriages and I lost a baby at 23 weeks. Um, and I, although those were never, uh, no doctor, because my gastroenterologist said, well, you've been gluten-free for 12 months. This shouldn't be happening. And my reproductive endocrinologist said, you've been gluten-free for 12 months. This shouldn't be happening. Um, so, you know, Part of my challenge is just feeling like there's not a lot of um, 
education across disciplines around celiac mm -hmm. disease, mm -hmm. um, and that that was that was certainly a challenge for me. So I have two beautiful sons. I adopted two beautiful boys. I have a wonderful family now, and um, you know that has sort of a and, and my sons probably will not have celiac disease or not uh, a risk from me. Um, but uh, it's still, it was very, very difficult, and it was a really long period of time, and it's really frustrating that no one, um, that I was sick for so long and that I saw so many doctors uh, before I was ever diagnosed. Katie, thank you. And now you've heard from two of our panelists who have children with celiac disease, Katie herself who is, and now I'm gonna introduce Pianca, um, who was also diagnosed as a child, and her story has a unique twist. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Sorry, I have a little bit of a sore throat. Um, my name's Priyanka. I um, was diagnosed with celiac disease oh, 15 years ago now. Um, I was diagnosed actually through family screening. So um, my brother was initially very ill, had the classic symptoms. He was you know, short stature, losing a lot of weight, distended belly, kind of looks like the picture in the medical textbooks. Uh, and you know, our family went through a lot trying to figure out what was wrong and trying to diagnose him. And then eventually he was you know, found to have celiac disease. Um, my mother happens to be a pediatric gastroenterologist. <laughs> so she, uh, she knew you know, that, that, it's, uh, you know, that we had to do the family screening. So we went forward uh, and did all the family screening. And lucky me, I was the, the winner <laughs> uh, who, who had celiac disease as well. Um, I did not fit the classic picture of celiac disease. I was tall, never had any weight loss issues, never had any you know, belly pain symptoms that I could think of. I um, you know, would have headaches and things like that, but not really anything specific. Um, so for me, that, that initial transition to going gluten-free after being diagnosed was very challenging. Uh, I think to tell someone who has no apparent symptoms that they need to change their whole life and change their diet and, and alter their social situation uh, because of a risk that you know is in their stomach but they don't they don't know about in their mind you know they it, it was very challenging so I think um, that initial okay I guess I have to change my whole life now uh, even though I'm 12 years old don't understand what's wrong don't have any, uh, I don't feel better now that I'm gluten free, I just feel the same, um, was, was really a hard thing to deal with. I think, you know, I'm very lucky to have a family that was very, very supportive of it. Um, I have a sister also who does not have uh, celiac disease, so there was a lot of kind of family interplay uh, about, you know, one person had symptoms, was diagnosed with celiac, felt better after going on the gluten free diet, my brother. Myself, no symptoms, had to do this diet, <coughs> didn't feel any differently. Uh, and then my sister, who kind of you know, watched all of this happen, got to still continue to eat gluten. And there was, there was a lot of challenges in terms of where we go on vacation, what we do as a family, um, those sort of things. Uh, then, like I said, my, my mother is a pediatric gastroenterologist. And we, um, as a family, got very uh, involved in the celiac community because of that. We kind of, uh, you know, she had the celiac center at Children's Hospital Philadelphia for quite some time. Uh, and was working with Beyond Celiac. So I think we, we kind of grew into this, this great community here where we, we were able to, to learn a lot and share our stories, and um, that helped. But I think um, kind of to, to Julie's point, the, the psychosocial aspects of all of this are very, very challenging. So even though you know, we had this great support system, we had the education, we had every single you know, thing that set us up to be you know, the best patient with, with celiac disease. It was still hard day in and day out. And I think uh, especially, you know, I was 12 when I was diagnosed uh, and, and going through high school, college, medical school, and, and, you know, now residency, it's been hard and there's been ups and downs and times when I'm just, you know, sometimes don't even believe that I actually have celiac disease. You know, <laughs> nothing like really, I maybe get glutened, I maybe something happens and I have no idea. I don't really have symptoms necessarily. And I think, you know, to be the person who's just like, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna eat lunch because there's no option here, or I'm not gonna go to, I didn't study abroad when I was uh, in undergrad because I was nervous about um, going to a new place, a new city by myself and mm -hmm. not knowing what I could eat. And uh, I think the, the lack of spontaneity that, that happens when you have to do this diet mm -hmm. is, is probably the most challenging part of it for me. Um, but you know, there's good days, there's bad days. It's, it's not the worst, but it's not, it's not great. <laughs> Thank you. With that and with all of these stories, one, the next area I'd like to really dive into, and this is where we would start opening up for questions and things too, is that ripple effect of the diagnosis on the family. 
because I think that when you're diagnosed, as Priyanka said, you're not diagnosed in isolation. And I think we need to understand those social and emotional aspects of what happens to the family. And Natalie, I I'm going to begin with you on this because you're the, the sole person with celiac disease in your house. I am the sole person with celiac disease in my house. So, um, you know, I, like um, Priyanka said, it's, it's um, tough and it's not the worst. Um, we do not have a gluten-free kitchen. My uh, husband and kids will eat gluten. Um, we have separate pots and pans and pizza trays and toaster ovens. Um, a funny story, I went on a family vacation this year and I, I wouldn't say I've not gone on a family trip because of celiac. I will say that I travel with a suitcase of food everywhere I go, even the celiac conference. Um, so uh, we traveled overseas. It was very exciting. And um, I showed up with my suitcase full of food and I didn't have enough of the gluten-free flour. So I called my little brother who was still in the States and asked him to buy another bag. But my parents also traveled with half of a suitcase of gluten-free food. And my brother from New Zealand also traveled with half a suitcase of gluten-free food, and then I had to bring it all back. Um, it does affect everybody in the family, and I would say, you know, in, in my family, everybody's very conscientious about it, um, and even uh, sort of hyper-vigilant. Um, it, it, a lot of times I don't eat the food that's served, so I go to a lot of conferences for my job, um, and I find myself eating, you know, a plate of lettuce. Um, because the plate of lettuce is gluten-free as long as the croutons haven't been put in it. Um, I, um, I work in a, in a food desert, and so um, I think that, you know, I think I'm fortunate in that gluten-free food is relatively accessible where I live, but I'm very aware that there are people for, who are diagnosed with celiac where that food is not readily available to them. And the place that I work, if I don't bring my lunch in with me, um, I don't have anything to eat. Um, and it would be very difficult for me to find something uh, uh, at one of the small corner stores. Um, so I think that the, the ripple effects have been that everybody is consciously vigilant and everybody is constantly thinking. Um, and, you know, I've been in situations with my family where a holiday meal, uh, you know, someone sprinkles flour on the turkey or someone sprinkles flour in the stew um, because it's habit and in their homes they're not doing that and all of a sudden it's a, an entire meal that I can't eat. Um, so it, you know, it is, it's, it's tough and it is, I know that my family um, is also constantly being, I'm hypervigilant, but they're also being hypervigilant um, and that it is, it's tough to be in social environments or in conference environments or in work environments where you just can't eat what everybody else is eating. Thank you. And Priyanka, you explained the ripple effect in your family. I'd like to cover another issue, and that is, um, from the patient perspective, the role of the, of the healthcare provider. And Julie, I'm going to have you speak to this, because I think, again, her journey has a unique twist um, to it. And I'd like you to explain how you felt, the help you got, and what your end result was. Okay. Uh, so when I was diagnosed, we went to see a dietitian, a pediatric dietitian, and when we walked in, she tried, um, but printing papers out, um, and we would ask questions, and she would Google, and I was like, why are we here? This doesn't make any sense. I felt like, you know, she said, I feel like you guys know more than, than I do, and we walked out, and, and it wasn't helpful. Um, and then when, as I started to research, I was a middle school math teacher for 12 years. And um, I loved my job teaching middle school, um, but I did decide it was time for a career change. Well, through all of my research uh, with celiac disease, I said, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm going to teach food. So after we were diagnosed, I decided to go back to school and I went to uh, UNC Chapel Hill and got a Master's of Public Health and Registered Dietitian training. So now I am a Registered Dietitian because <laughs> I felt like we could do better. I felt like we could support people with celiac disease throughout this entire process um, in a loving and knowledgeable 
way. So I now have a nutrition practice in Raleigh where I help patients that are newly diagnosed or who are working through celiac disease. And when they come to me and they say, I felt crazy, nobody would believe me. Or every time we go out to eat, my stomach churns not from you know, the food, but from nervousness. I look at them and say, I know, I understand that. And so we talk through it and I don't feel like enough medical providers understand that a brochure, a handout is not helpful. I mean, it, you can read it, but there's so much more to the gluten-free diet and managing it that a lot of people at that don't provide that support. So I'm trying to be the support that we wanted and needed and that people in the celiac disease community need as well. Thank you. Natalie, would you, because I know you had a journey with your healthcare providers too, would you like to comment on that? Um, yeah, I think the, the challenge is, and we know that um, with these autoimmune disorders, they pair together. Um, so of course, you know, my daughter, she had, or she has alopecia, right? So one autoimmune hair loss, and then, you know, obviously celiac. Um, it's challenging because, you know, for a while I was seeing a GI, I was seeing my pediatrician, she had two different dermatologists trying to figure out, you know, like different ways possibly to um, see if we could start hair regrowth. Um, and no one really talked together. Like I don't have one person who could kind of look at her holistically and maybe, um, you know, figure out a healthcare plan unique to her um, to try to help figure out some of these, you know, some of these things. I mean, we follow the strict, you know, gluten-free diet. We're very strict with it. Um, she did have hair regrowth. I want to say three to six months um, after she was diagnosed, it almost all came back just to fall out again. So sometimes it does make me think maybe there is something related, but I just don't have um, like a team cohesively to put that together. So it's very challenging. And we've heard that as we were talking, getting ready for this, that that was one of the common threads. You know, we have a few minutes left. Priyanka, I want you to address some of those psychosocial issues. As a younger person on our panel, what is it like living day to day with, you, you're in medical residency, what are the struggles, what are the things that are wins, what are the losses that you, that you experience? Sure, um, so I think the, there's challenges. There's a lot of challenges unique to probably having any dietary restriction, but I think especially uh, celiac disease and some challenges which you, you wouldn't expect. So even, even I you know, am in a hospital, I work in a hospital, and I even as a medical student, I was rotating in, in multiple different hospitals. There's not even options there. You know, I, I can have a salad every day. You know, we can go to the cafeteria, grab whatever, but it's not the same. And, and I think, you know, and especially in medical school and residency, you know, they try to lure students and residents to things with food and it's always pizza or salad or, or sandwiches and, and things like that and I can never um, have anything. So I do spend quite a lot of time hungry. I mean, I, 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 you know, in my one month past rotation, I lost 10 pounds just because I didn't have time to go out and get something or I was uh, coming home late every day, didn't have time to prepare food for the next day um, to bring in with me and so then I would just you know, snack on some pudding that I found in, in a fridge and, you know, things like that rather than, you know, having a full uh, nutritious meal. And I think it, it does impact, you know, your ability to think and to function and to, to be able to just live a regular day when so much of your brain is preoccupied with what you're going to be able to eat. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there, I keep coming back to this spontaneity thing. I think it's, it, that's the hardest part that has been there for me is, is not being able to just pick up and, and do something like in a normal day like everyone else. Thank you. Um, this closes our, our panel, but I think as, as we got to discuss things leading up to this, which I wish you could have heard all of our wonderful conversations, one theme came out, and, and I'm, I think it was Katie who said it, and I'm trying to remember back from our phone call, that you know it, there are challenges, but each of us has made our world successful and plentiful. It's just that it's small. 
And that's what I want you to realize, that we can make it happen, but it's small, it lacks spontaneity, and it can be limited. I want to say thank you to Beyond Celiac for this opportunity and to my panel. now segue and introduce Dr. Joe Murray, Professor of Medicine, Gastroenterologist, Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the Mayo Clinic, and known to all of us as one of the leaders in uh, clinical scientific research in celiac disease. Joe, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, so in this, hopefully, whirlwind tour of alternative therapies, we're going to go beyond what we've just heard about about um, you know the gluten-free diet for celiac disease um, and really to address where we are now and what barriers remain and the, what barriers will come up in our discussions through the day I'm delighted to have disclosures you know 20 years ago there were no disclosures in celiac disease um, this is a slide from a um, review that Kieran Kelly and colleagues uh, put together earlier this year about the current clinical trials in celiac disease. And the great thing is it's a busy slide. There's a lot of stuff that is happening, starting to happen, some that's already completed. And it's really this group here, the treatment part that we're focusing on, the completed trials, the active trials, and that was the beginning of 2019. And even since then, there have been changes. One of the, as a researcher, clinician researcher, one of the attractive things about celiac disease is we know a lot about what happens from gluten to the intestinal damage that occurs. We understand a lot of the parts of that pathway. We don't know, understand everything, and particularly weak spots are initial triggering of the disease, why sometimes it goes haywire in patients who are doing their best on a gluten-free diet, but, but there's a lot that we understand. And what that means is that there's a lot of potential places you could interrupt that reaction to gluten that occurs in celiac disease. And so that could be early on, it's changing wheat. There have been several attempts to do that, not really very successful is what I would say. There is enzymes and proteases or gluteinases, and we will talk about those somewhat. There's this binding agent that can bind gluten. That, as far as I understand, is not being um, um, followed because the dose of binder that was required to bind up the gluten in the gut was high enough to cause symptoms of its own. Um, probiotics uh, and varieties of things that are trying to alter the immune system in a more non-specific way, and sometimes in a specific way. We talk about tight junction regulation and what, what's happening with lorazotide. Um, restoring tolerance has been a major focus, and we're going to talk about that at some length. And then uh, things like anti-IL-15. I'm not going to talk about the TG2 blocker, but there is a phase two trial going on in Europe that aims to block the activity of this enzyme that's native within us, transglutaminase, that may well alter gluten or alters gluten to make it more antigenic. And what about a drug that might block the activity of that enzyme? And there's a trial, a phase two trial ongoing, and we'd hope to have some results or hear about results of that at the beginning of 2020. So um, those are some of the targets. So there's lots of potential targets. Those are just some of the targets. It's a horse race. You know, this is a challenging horse race, and it's a long race. Um, what about the glutenases? So the whole idea here that if somebody gets exposed to gluten, if you take something that breaks down or targets the gluten, that it makes it less likely to trigger a response. One of the earliest one was ANPEP. This was derived from Aspergillus niger, basically a fungus that has that can grow on wheat and it can eat gluten. And this was a study done early on. 16 patients with treated celiac disease, ANPEP versus placebo, a very odd design at the time. Um, everyone coming in got ANPEP and gluten, and then they were randomized to a washout phase and then get either ANPEP with gluten or a placebo with gluten and look at the response. And basically it failed because the placebo-treated patients did not relapse. There were no side effects, of course, and what's happened is that 
there was the company who was developing it decided not to promote it or develop it as a drug for the treatment of celiac disease, and it ended up being imported into the U.S. as a dietary supplement ingredient where it's been added. It's not used or promoted for the treatment of celiac, or should not be used for the uh, treatment of celiac disease. Um, so, but that was an example of uh, an early and I think a relatively weak attempt at trying to uh, address this. There's the Alvine, A, what was called Alvine 003, now Immunogenics 001, I think, um, which is basically this um, combination of two um, enzymes that are focused on gluten to try and maximize the ability to break down gluten uh, within the GI tract. Uh, an early study with a challenge study with gluten showed that it would protect against, to some degree, against damage to the intestine with a gluten challenge, a very common type of trial. And for I think for all stakeholders here, it's a key concept for many of the trials that are undertaken is, will patients with celiac disease undergo a gluten challenge? A gluten challenge that is often substantial enough to cause symptoms and injury in the intestine. And I have to say with the very first trial that now is well over 10 years old with this involved a gluten challenge in patients that we had previously been preaching at about you have to be gluten free. They've learned it, they've in, it's ingrained in them, we have to avoid. And we've heard from the panel that view it, gluten as poison. Um, and we're telling them to take it as part, or we're asking them, asking them to take it as part of a trial. So um, that's a common. And then this, this agent went on to a phase 2B trial, the largest trial so far held in celiac disease. And these are individuals who are continuing to have symptoms despite doing their best on a gluten-free diet. And this was a complicated trial, somewhat prolonged, a, a, a screening period followed by a, a qualification period where patients were recording their symptoms every day, and then into randomized into a, a variety of, of, of groups, including placebo. And that's a second key part of clinical trials, is we are asking people to take the risk of getting a placebo. Now, usually it's also in the context of maybe of continuing gluten-free diet, but in these challenge, in challenge studies, it's not in the context of continuing on a gluten-free diet. So we're asking people to come off their standard treatment and to expose themselves to a gluten challenge. And so that's a second key concept in many of the studies. And we have to wrap our heads around that as a community. Um, the, and then into a treatment phase, 12-week treatment phase, and then some went on to a, an additional treatment phase for more prolonged. The bottom line was that this drug did not, have a, did not have a difference or an additional benefit over the um, individuals getting placebo. And the key thing was everybody improved over time in their participation in the trial. And that, I think, is, is important to recognize. The other thing about it was, Seropositive patients, going back to look at the data, the patients who were seropositive coming into the study, they seemed to have a benefit in terms of symptom protection when they got the higher doses of the enzymes. Um, and the drug has been reborn, albeit in a new form, through a, a company that bought out the assets and are continuing to explore its potential use. Um, there are other designer enzymes that have been in the development preclinical or now moving into clinical development with clinical trials um, that aim to be even more potent or more precise in terms of their glutenase effect. Um, so in general, the glutenases have proven to be safe, at least thought to be safe. They target the immunogenic peptides. There are now several candidates at various levels of development, but they only work if the patient gets gluten, and that's a key concept. These will only show benefit if the person is being exposed to gluten, be that deliberate as part of a challenge or inadvertently as part of trying to live their real life, as we've heard so eloquently from our, 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 our pa previous panel, uh, doing their best gluten-free. But if they're absolutely gluten-free, living in a bubble, never getting exposed to any the slightest bit of gluten, then it's hard to see how a glutenase can help you. Um, what about the gluten sequestrant is done, um, is gone. What about lorazotide acetate, the permeability regulator that makes tight junctions tighter? 
Um, it was shown early, it's had several, quite a few trials now, it's showing the gluten challenge trial, showing protection from symptoms, being exposed to gluten, the protection from the rise in, in tissue transutaminase antibodies with a gluten challenge. And it went on to a real life study, similar to the celiac action study, and done a little earlier than the celiac action study in, in, in same, same idea, run in period, randomized to get placebo or varying doses of a drug and then a follow up period. And this one only looked at symptoms. It did not look at, at, at intestinal biopsies. And the key thing again is everybody's symptoms got better, even those on the placebo got better over time. And this again is a feature of bringing people into a study. And then there was a difference that the people getting the lowest dose seemed to have a sustained benefit compared to those um, getting placebo. And curiously, compared to those getting a higher dose. So this was a re reverse dose effect. And that's, this drug is now started, has just started a phase three trial, um, and is probably the leading candidate currently. One of the things that I learned about this was the pattern of symptoms. Celiac disease doesn't seem to have symptoms that stay the same all the time every day. They vary dramatically. And we heard already about the worry, the anxiety that occurs around traveling, around social events, the exposures to gluten that occur sporadically and unpredictably. And this probably can contribute to these very sporadic, unpredictable, and often severe symptoms. And recently at the celiac meeting in Paris, we had a very eloquent um, and presentation on uh, the patient voice. And it was basically there was a study that showed that over 50% of people are missing school or work on a regular basis because of symptoms related to their celiac disease. And this is basically the chaotic, shows the chaotic nature of daily scoring of symptoms that can go from being negative to being very severe and life affecting. Um, the degree of symptoms, the worse the symptoms, the greater the benefit that that drug seemed to have. And that, again, is, that's probably the leading candidate right now starting into phase three. But that itself has been a very slow development process. What about tolerance? What about the idea of giving people some type of immunotherapy, something that encourages tolerance uh, of the immune system? Can we tame the immune system? And David Wraith at the recent Paris meeting um, showed a presentation showing all of the various tricks that immunologists are trying to do to trick or tame the immune system into behaving itself when it comes to reactions to gluten. Um, and there are many questions about how would this work? What's the best approach? Is the approach going to be one that encourages some bystander suppression, which can be great if you've got lots of inflammation, or might not so great if it's, if it's taking down some protection, for example. And then which pr uh, pr uh, approach will permit repeated exposures? It's not just a once-off rare event where a peanut allergic person might get an accidental exposure to gluten, or sorry, to peanuts, but is this going to permit the repeated exposures to gluten that occur with patients with celiac disease? Next FACTS trial, we have Bob Anderson there. I would regard him as one of the heroes of clinical research who's dedicated his entire career to, to searching for answers for people with celiac disease. And, and uh, he presented the results of the Next FACTS II, um, recent phase two uh, trial showing that there are Gluten-specific T cells seem to cause these immediate responses. I mean, very surprising to me, within hours of exposure to gluten, T cells, which I think of as seeping cells that need to be woken up to be activated, seem to respond very quickly and very specifically within a couple of hours of exposure. I mean, and I think it tells us, it identifies us, where is the targets of what we need to be able to block if we're going to prevent these acute symptoms? Um, and there are some exciting works that came, came from this that may have diagnostic um, implications. Um, this was a complicated study, and anybody who knows anyone who participated in the study, this meant lots of visits, lots of, of injections to try and start inducing tolerance with the next vax, and then with these follow, um, follow up masked food challenges that would be trying to identify a response. Was this being able to suppress an immune response? And basically the results, the primary result which looked at this immune response to a marker of immune response to gluten and these gluten challenges showed that the next fax 2 did not extend its protection from protecting against itself or those particular PEP3 peptides that are derived from 
the various gluten proteins um, that a lot of people with celiac disease recognize, it did not extend it, that protection to a protection from gluten. And a, ter a terrific disappointment for all. Um, so those gluten-induced GI symptoms and the cytokine response to these gluten challenges was not suppressed by Nexvax. Um, the other area of gluten tolerance, and we have Dr. Stephen Miller, who's the inventor of this um, technology, and this was a recent, uh, public, a recent presentation at the European uh, GI meetings in Barcelona. Um, and basically, the core uh, is this uh, nanoparticles, is the notion that when you uh, basically contain an antigen within a particular size and type of nanoparticle that when the immune system picks it up, it becomes tolerant to that antigen. That's the idea and concept behind it. And this was the first time that this um, concept and this technology was applied to humans was in the context of celiac disease. So, so do think of celiac disease as not only looking for clinical trials that are going to help itself, but pioneering areas or technology that might be useful in other areas in the future. Um, and there are, of course, many ways the immune system might express that tolerance. It may be there are Treg cells, which we think as good guys when it comes to an immune um, tolerance of something. Also, energy or deletion, energy where the cells just are tired and don't seem to mount a reactive response, or deletion where they get deleted com uh, completely. Um, and this proof of concept study involved was first was a safety study of taking patients with celiac disease. So the first safety study were done in patients with celiac disease, some of them at our center. And then the challenge study, which again is that common design of where patients with celiac disease, usually well treated, are then challenged with gluten in the face of the drug or a placebo to look at the responses and protection. And basically, the exciting results um, from this study suggested that for the primary outcome of the study that it seemed to um, block this increase in these um, inflammatory type cells that were pushed into the circulation with the gluten challenge. And so it seemed to be protective of that, which was exciting. There were also, it seemed to provide some level of protection against damage to the intestine incited by that challenge. So very exciting work and we're looking forward to further development of this technology for celiac disease. So there are at least, those are two of at least what I know of at least three tolerant approaches. The other one, which is still preclinical, actobiotics, which is the selective delivery of gluten peptides expressed by a particular food bug that's uh, it, about to enter um, clinical trials, um, and so there are, as I said, this is a horse race that has um, significant fences and challenges um, along the development route. There's anti-IL-15, IL-15 is a key cytokine in the damage that occurs in the intestine, and there are at least, well, there's several agents that might block this effect, the effect of IL-15, and this has been used, the Amgen molecule is, has been used in several trials for refractory celiac disease, non-responsive celiac disease, and also in a challenge trial of patients doing well on a gluten-free diet, and it seems to show some benefit, and it's going to continue with a new trial, um, a phase two trial, to try and understand its benefit in patients with ongoing symptoms, despite doing their best on a gluten-free diet, and that, that trial is planned for the beginning of 2020. What about other things like probiotics? I'm asked almost every day by my patients, what about taking probiotics? I would say the great majority of my patients are, are taking probiotics. There's unfortunately little real data on the effect of probiotics and celiac disease. This was one small trial from Argentina where they took untreated patients and randomized them to get this um, Bifido infantis, um, and in newly untreated patients and compare it to patients who are not getting it and all staying eating gluten. And there was thought to be slight benefits, but this was really not a, what I would consider a significant endpoint. So there really is no data on probiotics in the context of celiac disease. What should not be done? 
And this is a study that was done in Finland with a drug called, um, from Chemocentrix, it was a CCR9 antagonist. So this was a drug being developed in the, for the realm of, of inflammation. And a trial was done there, it was completed, and there's never been even an abstract of results presented, ever. And this is what we, me as a researcher, those of you as patients who could become subjects, should not be involved in. No research should be undertaken uh, involving patients if the results will not be made public. And that's an, an absolute requirement, I believe, an ethical issue as well. And I don't think there is any, any researcher that I know of who would agree to participate in a trial or allow their patients or subjects to participate in a trial that will not be made public at, within some reasonable time frame. So I only can assume that there was no benefit or that there was some significant side effect that occurred in this trial. So some fences are really pretty high uh, when it comes to clinical trials, especially for a disease where there has been no therapeutic uh, available other than the gluten-free diet. Um, so where are we in the pipeline? There's a, a, a number of stumbles. Um, lactoglutinase is up and running again, or at least walking again. Um, the um, the lorazotide acetate is starting, has already started a phase three. It, we've heard about immu uh, the uh, immunosanti and Nexvax2. The bioline has stopped. Um, there are others that have been, haven't actually implemented a clinical program as yet, but are uh, still being shopped around looking for money, and that's another, another barrier. Um, a couple of, of studies that were anx anxiously awaiting their beginning. Uh, the core molecule, which uh, Takeda is going to be continuing development on, or hopefully to continue development on, we're, we're very excited by. And then the, Desira, uh, the Zadira, Dr. Falk trial in Europe on the, on the TG, TG2 blockers are, are anxiously awaited. So there's now a strong precedence of trials. There are many people with celiac disease and willing to participate in trials. There are over 2,000 people who participated. There's a track record of, of discussions that we're going to hear from our, our colleagues in the FDA. Clinical trials are feasible, both with and without a gluten challenge. Subject behavior in the study, this in-study effect, I think, is very important of how we handle that because we're trying to study celiacs who are having problems in real life. But of course, participating in a study is not really a reflection of real life. And how can a drug that prevents gluten effects work if the subjects don't get exposed to gluten in the study? All trial uh, results have to be reported. There are now efforts to repurpose agents from other areas towards celiac disease. The costs are substantial. They're even mind-boggling substantial as you get closer to these later studies. And there are still plenty of subjects willing to participate in clinical trials. They're not always where the trials are going on, and I've had patients travel long distances to participate in trials. And I will end there. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. And we are on time after the first two sessions. Fantastic. Um, uh, as I introduce Raj Schneider, the principal of Raz MD Patient Affairs Consulting, who will moderate our second patient panel, consisting of people who have participated in celiac clinical trials. And as they're walking to the stage and podium, um, I'll ask you all to uh, please be uh, writing down and uh, keeping your questions and comments that you would like to share. At the end of the morning, we have a full 45-minute session of Q&A commentary discussion, disagreement, et cetera, uh, about the entire morning session. So please, uh, if we don't have time for questions from the, from the room during the uh, panel, it's important to hear from the panelists, um, we will vet all of those and fully flesh those out in the discussion period. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. So I am Roz Schneider. I'm a physician focusing on human-centered design in healthcare and in, in research, really working with patients who are the experts in what they need and want, as you've heard already. Uh, that's been the thread in my clinical practice years, in academia, in my years at Pfizer, where 
most recently I led global patient affairs, and now as I'm doing consulting. So I've gotten to know through my work at, at Pfizer, uh, the folks who lead beyond celiac and have always been very impressed with what you're doing and, and what we expect for the future. So I was delighted when Marie asked me to moderate this session that, that includes the true medical heroes of this area and, and our future, people who have participated in one or more clinical trials and who can share their stories from the, the trenches. Just a note, we're going to try not to name any specific clinical trials or products so that there shouldn't be any perception that beyond celiac or we are endorsing or disparaging any of those. So here with me today are people who have traveled near and far to get here. So uh, Ellen McKinley from Nevada, Dr. Ann Horsborough from Texas, uh, Ellen McKinley from Nevada, and I, oh, I did this twice, <laughs> because you shouldn't write down the names of people before sitting down and knowing oh. where everybody sit, is sitting, so sorry about that. Jen Arders and Tina Ramos, Jen Arders from Pennsylvania and Tina Ramos from Michigan. So to get started, I'm going to just ask each of you to take about three minutes or so to keep an eye on the clock. Uh, introduce yourself, talk about your clinical trial experience, and what motivated you to even become involved in, in clinical research? And tell us a little bit about what you had to do in those, those trials. Maybe starting with Ellen, since I introduced you twice. So. <laughs> okay. Um, I live in Nevada, and Reno, Nevada. And um, I have a niece who is a pharmaceutical rep who, lived in, who lives in San Clemente, California. And she was actually... Uh, the one who um, told me that she um, had heard about, through her visits to different doctor's offices, a clinical trial that was going on in Sacramento. So um, she gave me the information. Um, I sent an email and applied and was contacted. And um, Reno to Sacramento is about 120 miles, so a couple hour drive, not that far. So I really wanted to participate in, in this trial. So luckily, I was accepted. Um, I went down there. They did blood work. Um, I did have to have a, a, an initial biopsy in California. That was a little unsettling because you're with all these people that I didn't know. Um, I had a gastroenterologist in Reno who I liked very much. And so going down there and not knowing, you know, who was putting me to sleep and all these different people um, talking about my, my case was a little bit unsettling. But um, other than that, I, uh, when, when I got the results of the initial biopsy and I had already had one, my villi was very blunted. Um, I was suffering from osteoporosis. Um, I was anemic. I had lost a lot of weight. Um, but I was also like um, the other gal that was up here. I am asymptomatic. I could eat gluten all day long, and I never ever felt sick. And I and um, but I I was suffering for a long time, and so it took a little while to get diagnosed. Anyway, um, I started this drug trial uh, where you every time you sat down to a meal, you would drink. You mix this powder with a drink, and they wanted you to complete it within the first part of the meal and um, not to have very many snacks, just try to eat three meals a day and always accompany it with this drug. So I was in this trial, I did this for about 16 weeks. At the end, um, oh, I forgot to say at the beginning, with the biopsy, uh, my stomach was, they said there were folds, the villi was blunted, um, my, that the antibody, the TTGAs, I believe, were very, very high. Um, 150 or something, which they said was way out of range. But um, at the end, uh, when I had the biopsy done again after the end of the trial, um, they didn't really want to give me a lot of the results, which I found also a little bit unsettling. Um, but the uh, gastroenterologist who was there and looking at my results said that my stomach looked normal. It was in the normal range. The villi were no longer blunted. 
the folds were gone. Um, I had another blood test. They were, the numbers were way, way down. Um, this drug, they had told me I should allow for cross-contamination. So not eat gluten, which I was happy about, but um, not to worry about cross-contamination. So my husband and I shared the same toaster. I would eat French fries cooked in a fryer that had, had been cooked with things that were battered and fried. I didn't actually eat gluten, but I did allow for the cross-contamination. And I, it seemed to be OK. So um, I went back to my gas, ga, gastroenterologist in Reno. Uh, I've gone every year since then. And um, my numbers are a 2, which basically he tells me that that's the antibodies, these TTGAs that were way out of range or have been like for the last three or four years a 2. Um, my stomach still continues to be fine. It's like he said that. Um, it's almost like I'm in a remission where my body isn't recognizing that I even have this disease anymore. What was frustrating for me was I really wanted to find out. I assumed I must not have had the placebo because I felt like I really reacted well to this drug. So I wanted to know, was I on the 100 milligrams, the 500 milligrams, the 900 milligrams? I, and I never could ever find out. The gal that I had gone through, this registered nurse who had been my... Um, coordinator. She ended up quitting. Um, and there was no one ever that I could, I, I researched it because I knew the drug I was on. And I found out what had happened to the company. But I didn't know ever, and I still don't know exactly what I took or what the, the amounts were. Um, so that's my story. <laughs> Thanks so much. And I, I think some of these themes are going to continue when you hear from our other panelists, and also in our discussions, I think we already heard in the previous presentation about the importance of sharing results, not only to the scientific community and the public, but to the people who've really taken their own personal risk and time and expense, in many cases, to travel, again, very far, even though you said two hours is not that far, to, to others, two hours might feel much, like much more of a burden. So I think we need to, to keep that in mind. And, and Anne, maybe you can share your experience that also includes a, a slightly different uh, as perspective on the results. Um. Sure. Good morning. My name's Anne Horsburgh, uh, diagnosed in 2010 after 19 years, a couple of dozen doctors in three countries. Um, signed up for a clinical trial that I found on um, clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, it was a fairly high participation kind of trial. I was in the clinic uh, twice a week uh, for five months. Um, work requires that I, rec I report in my annual report how many hours I spend on community service, and I regard donating my body to science as community service. So I actually have really good data on this. I was in there for five months, and I put 42 and a half hours. Um, so, uh, you know, initial screening, all of that stuff, uh, injections twice a week in the clinic, and then auto um, self-administers injections at home. Uh, there were gluten challenges, um, which, you know, you throw up, whatever. Um, though really, enough with the gluten in the water thing, give us a piece of bread, for crying out loud, a piece of bread. If you're going to make me eat gluten, make it be nice gluten. Um, my, I had, um, I was very interested in whether I was getting the treatment or the placebo. Um, I was having symptoms from the treatment and I wanted very much to know um, if it was my brain doing it or if it was um, actually the treatment. Um, after the entire thing was over and the blinding was removed, the nurse who handled my care phoned me to tell me that I was in the treatment class and gave me a bunch of my data and it gave me all my records um, from the trial. Um, I don't know if she did that for everybody or if she just did it because I was all kind of up in the science business. Um, possibly she did it just because I'm annoying. Um, but I got everything and that was brilliant. Um, I really appreciated that. Um, it was by and large a fantastic experience and I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Um, I actually tried to sign up for another clinical trial um, well, I, because uh, I tr tried to find more information, 
Um, so I emailed some people running another clinical trial near me in, in, in Dallas and um, got insufficient information to actually make a decision about whether I could participate or not in terms of the practicalities, the logistics, where do I have to go, how often do I have to go. And so that was a very different kind of experience because I was under-informed and as a consequence of being under-informed, I couldn't make a reasonable decision. But in general, anytime you want to experiment on me, I'm here for you. <laughs> Thank you for that. And, uh, Jen. Yeah, hi, good morning. I'm Jen Arders. I uh, live right outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. And I was diagnosed in uh, 2011 and very quickly after my doctor told me that there was a clinical trial going on and that I would be a great candidate. So I didn't have much time to react. I had no research done. I had no idea what celiac disease was. I looked at my doctor with, like he had snakes on his head. Um, I had no idea what was going on and he said, well, you've had your endoscope within six months. You completely fall in line with this because you've been gluten free for six to eight months. So let's get you in the trial. Trial started and I was at the doctor's office at the site um, once, I think it was seven times, they took blood work. And um, I, I, again, I had no idea what was really going on. I had no idea what any of celiac disease was until I found the NFCA and did a lot of research there. Um, and for the next year, I really didn't know what my symptoms were. I didn't know what side effects were. I just didn't feel good. <laughs> was very tired all the time, started gaining weight, um, never knew that I had had really celiac disease at all. And um, throughout the trial, I had to take a medication very similar to if you are lactose intolerant and you take a lactate pill. So I would take one of those before every meal, before I ever ingested anything, and um, had a diary with a, a really archaic um, iPad, I guess. I don't even know what it was. Blackberry, for those of you that are, <laughs> know what a Blackberry is, or very old technology that did not work very well. Um, but at least I had paper as well to write down and track all of my information. And then when I would go into the doctor's office, um, after I guess um, it was a month, every month I had to go for a good eight months, take blood work, and I do not like needles at all. Um, I'm one of those that as soon as you bring a needle out, I'm on the floor. Uh, so it kind of helped me in two ways. It helped me to understand that needles aren't very bad and that I had blood work done every month and kind of got over my fear of needles. But it also helped me because I believe, I truly believe that I was on the actual drug because there was one night when uh, my husband made two different pastas. The house was gluten free and gluten contaminated. <laughs> so he had given me the pasta that was actually gluten. Took a big forkful of it, took my pill first, took a big forkful of it, no side effects. And he comes out and says, oh, you didn't eat that, did you? And I said, yeah, I, I did. Why? It tasted really, really good too. Um, and he said it was the gluten pasta and I had absolutely no effect. I never vomited, never had diarrhea, never cramping, bloating. You all know the, the side effects probably very well, but um, I felt cured and then the trial was over and I didn't know what to do with myself because I felt like I had this cure and I could really progress through my life and, and get through all of the anxiety of social atmospheres. Um, and it, it didn't happen that way. And it's like some others said from the prior panel, it's, it's very socially awkward. Um, you feel like you're the only one in the world that has this. Um, and honestly, I, I felt like a guinea pig throughout the entire trial because I didn't know enough about celiac disease. Now I know more about celiac disease, um, but I still feel very alone. And it's not until actually this summit which brought me to probably some near and dear, very good friends actually that I've met in less than 24 hours um, that I'll learn a little bit more. And hopefully we can all get to a point where socially it's not so hard. Um, and that's, that's my story. Thanks for sharing the important things that go into your considerations before, during, and after 
you participate in a clinical trial that goes beyond even the results, but how you feel about how you should live your life afterwards and having had this experience. So, Tina? Hi, my name is Tina Ramos, and I have participated in two trials. Um, I was originally diagnosed with celiac disease in 2013. I went to my GI doctor because I thought I had a stomach ulcer, and I came out of the endoscopy with celiac disease. And my husband was with me, and we looked at each other like, what in the world is that? Um, so after the shock of that, I got in contact with the University of Chicago, the Celiac Disease Foundation there, and I went and kind of got some information on what celiac is, completely overwhelmed with life. Um, they said that there was a trial going on in 2014. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna see what it is. Trial was fine, um, you know, just occasional drinking of this liquid and blood tests and things like that. So I thought, oh, that wasn't so bad. I'm gonna do another one. So I did another trial, the same gastroenterologist contacted me. This one, however, was a different ball game. This trial that I was in, um, I had to drive like 20 miles one way to get there. Took a lot of my time because I would have to go two times a week to this trial. They gave um, God awful drink. It was <laughs> just, ugh. it was awful. The first time they gave it to me, I had symptoms right away. I felt like I was nine months pregnant. It was just, I was sick. Um, the injections, they slowly would induce, or um, inject the gluten. Um, had an endoscopy, which I love having the endoscopies. I know that sounds strange, however, but it was a good way to check my body. How are my intestines doing? Um, so in the beginning I had an endoscopy and at the end I had an endoscopy. Um, I had to inject myself at home, which was very painful because, you know, who likes to be injected with needles? Um, once the trial was over, I was very, very ill for about a week. I, it was almost like having withdrawals. Um, I, for two days, I could not get out of the bathroom. I was on the floor, and I was like so scared because I'm like, oh my gosh, what has happened? Um, but yes, I, I feel that I did have the drug in that, and that my body was saying, whoa, what, what happened now, you know? Um, why do I wanna do trials? Um, I'm motivated to participate because I wanna help people who are like me, who get the shock of their life. You have celiac, you cannot eat gluten anymore. Well, where's the support? I did not have support besides my family. I wanna help people to know that it's okay. I survive, I hate it every day, but I, I survive. Um, the positive thing about the study was, like I said, um, the blood work, I could see how my thyroid is doing. I could see you know, if my diabetes is okay. Um, my villi, how are they doing? The keeping in track. Um, the negative about the study was that I did not know the results. All of a sudden, the study's over. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, well, what happened? Did the, did the drug like get canceled? Did it, you know, is there anything you can give me information-wise about what happened? So it was kind of like, thank you very much. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Um, and Compensation, yes, I did get compensated, but money was not the motivator. 
compensation for me was knowing that I am making a difference to hopefully help researchers, doctors, find out information so that someday we'll be able to have a cure or at least, you know, be able to go to a dinner and enjoy our dinner and not have to worry about being the odd person who has gluten allergies. So, Thank you. And you've each contributed so much. Whether or not that particular molecule or, or therapy moves to the next stage, what you learn from that and what, again, in the future we hope will be shared with the broader community will allow that next step to happen. And I, and I know the, the theme other than, than Anne's is that you didn't have the support of knowing the results, either your personal results or the results of the trial afterwards. But what about the other types of support that you would have expected from the clinical trial site? Like you described feeling terrible, right? And you described having accidentally exposed yourself in a way that, that you wouldn't have. How did you feel that support was from from the clinical trial center, maybe starting with you, Tina. The center that I went to was amazing. They are so nice. Like they're very attentive. Like um, blood work, EKG, things like that. Anything abnormal. There, one of my EKGs was abnormal. So right away they, you know, notified me. Notified my primary. I made an appointment with my primary. My thyroid level was off, so right away they let me know that. So, and I'm contemplating doing another trial with them. Um, but they were awesome. They're friendly. It wasn't like a sterile white room with white cloths. You know, I mean, you get a nice comfy lazy boy and, you know, you get to watch Netflix and, you know, they're just very personable and I think that it's hard enough dealing with our disease, but when you go to a trial and they're comforting and they're approachable, I think that's the key because you're more likely to respond to them with them being nice than, okay, blood pressure, we're done. You know what I mean? Like very formal and cold like. So I think that was awesome. Um, I wish that there was a, like a support group of people who have done trials so we could like talk about it among each other of how we felt when we did the trial, you know, because I think it's important because we're giving up part of our lives for research, but are we the only ones? You know what I mean? And, and like we've talked here and it's, it's very comforting to know that there are others who are struggling also. Yeah, I, um, I can kind of echo your comments. However, the physicians were not really present. I never saw my gastroenterologist. I had a nurse that took the blood, that took my diary, downloaded my diary, and it was pretty much have a nice day. Um, there was really no, no help about one, the trial, to the diet, and three, the disease. So it was more scientific, I felt like. Again, I, I felt more like a guinea pig in my experience than um, a patient. Um, and I think that that's something that could be changed. Uh, definitely resources, resources, resources. Um, like I said, I got really thrown into the trial right away after my um, diagnosis. So. I um, had no time to react, and I, I feel like I still don't have time to react. Um, anytime we go out, there's, there's really no really an easy way. So it, it wasn't very, I wouldn't say it wasn't friendly, but it wasn't engaging. It wasn't patient engaging. It was science engagement, which I understand that's why I was there for an actual trial to help all of us, but it was not very engaging didn't feel warm and cozy, um, didn't feel like I knew what was going on other than a scientific number. <laughs> but also to Tina's point is if there was an area where we could find more information out about these trials and, and 
I honestly didn't know anything about the trial until years after. Um, I'm in an industry now that supports clinical trials, and I, I now know that there's a website where we can find out all of this information. Who would have thought? Um, so it would have been nice to have with the letter saying your compensation and thank you so much for providing us with your information and your scientific data. This is where you can go to track the trial. Nothing like that was ever done. So it, it was not very friendly, per se. Yes. And, yeah. um, just on the release of results, um, I have a couple of thoughts uh, of things that participants should be told. Unless you actually do research, it's hard to understand the timeline between the completion of the trial and publication. Most of the public don't know that you complete the trial and then you do the data analysis and then you draft the manuscript and then you submit it for peer review and then it goes through four rounds of peer review. And while it's going through all of that, if you're going for one of the top tier journals, those results are embargoed. And so somebody needs to tell patients who are participating that it's not that you're being a jerk, and not telling them, is that you're trying to get a lot of publicity by getting into a top tier journal, and so they can't release those results until they're out, and nobody tells participants that. So there's that, somebody needs to explain to participants the kind of timeline involved in this kind of research. The second thing is that telling patients what happened at the end of the trial is easy, you've got their email addresses, stick a postdoc on writing up a plain English summary on it, it'll take them half a day, the minute that peer-reviewed paper hits preprint online, email everybody. It's not hard. That's it, it's not hard. And then you don't get this. Thank you. Oh. Yes, and mine was similar to Jan's. I, um, I saw uh, Dr for the biopsy at the beginning and at the end. Um, other than that, I just, it was a registered nurse. She was extremely nice, but every time I drive down there, she took my blood, we'd talk, I'd go over my diary, which I also kept a daily diary. Um, it was actually a phone call. I had to call in every day at a certain time, and they said that if you missed more than two phone calls, um, you would be exited out of the trial. Um, so I was always in a panic that, you know, by 5 o'clock I had to be on the phone. Um, it was an automated thing, and you press some buttons to let them know that you had completed the drug for that day and the times and all of that. So we would go over that and then make an appointment for me to come back again. Um, and she told me at the very end that I could contact her six to nine months later, and maybe by then she would be able to give me more information about um, how much of the drug I took, if in fact I did take that drug. Um, and then as I said, I kept waiting and I had her cell phone number, so at the end of six months I called and she never answered and um, never called me back. So I never found out anything. So. Thank you. And we're hearing a lot about the, the disruption of your daily life, uh, timing when exactly you can call and when you have to be someplace, how far you have to, to travel, and how much would it change things if, if some of the, the things that were done, some of the assessments were done remotely? Rather, because when you think about what we can do remotely now, the idea of going to a clinical trial site that's two hours away to have an electrocardiogram uh, or some other assessment that could be done locally. This is something that's being discussed across the industry about how we could be more patient-centered so that it's less of a disruption but not reduce the integrity of the, of the data and the quality of the trial. How much would that have played into your decisions about participation and even if you might have participated anyway, um, how much would it change the experience? And this is for any or all of you. It would have made it a lot easier because I needed to take time off of work for the four hour, you know, tr days. I had like four of them where I had to spend four hours there. So I'd have to take off of work, take my lunch, um, and, you know, the driving there, you know. I think it would be a lot easier and you'd probably get a lot more people if that option was available. 
Yeah, I think from my perspective, just understanding a little bit more about, you know, the full protocol and things of that nature is take a moment to look at the patients and what we are experiencing, um, how far we have to go, how long we have to be there, and, and write into your protocol. Give us Uber. <laughs> Nobody wants to have to uh, drive after a long, lengthy injection or anything of that nature. Make it for us, for you so we can help you best. And the model of clinical research design mm -hmm. is evolving so that there's more of a recognition, and this is really, this was my previous role at, at Pfizer, was to try and embed within the process of how we design clinical research that very early on and in, in iterative fashion that we would have patients or people representing the patient community at the table so that we could have the conversations in advance of when the decisions are being made or having a final approved protocol to make sure that, number one, we're looking at the right outcomes that are important, meaningful to, to the patient community, but also so that it's feasible because you're living your life outside of this clinical trial. And what are the ways that we can actually make it better um, and, and, again, more meaningful? Raz. Thank you so much. I think, would you like to have a concluding statement? Uh, just, I, I think we've heard the, some of the good, the bad, and the ugly, but we, I, I'm optimistic because uh, you expressed that you might consider a future clinical trial, some of you, and there's, there's more that we can do but a lot has already been done, and, and I think the theme from last night about acceleration is that if we collaborate together in, in meetings like this, we're gonna get to where you need to be faster. So thank you so much for, for doing this and for your participation in clinical trials. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, well, this concludes the webcast portion of the 2019 Beyond Celiac Research Summit. Thank you so much for those of you who tuned in. And for the rest of us, we now have a 10-minute break, and we will start right back here at 945 sharp. Thank you. <laughs>